Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to everyone joining us from around the world to the second and final day of this webinar on waste management and the circular economy. Nordic best practices brought to you by the Asian Development Bank, the Embassy of Sweden, Manila, the Norwegian Embassy, Manila, the Royal Danish Embassy, Manila, this is Sweden, and with the support of the Nordic Council of Ministers. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Rico Hizon. I am host and uh, moderator. Sorry, my uh, AirPods fell over there. <laughs> I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Rico Hizon, your moderator uh, and host for this webinar. And it is wonderful to see uh, hundreds of participants on this second day joining us from all over the world for this important gathering. But uh, before we proceed, we have some quick housekeeping announcements for attendees to take note of. Uh, participants will be receiving an email before the end of the week where we will include the link to the webinar recording, the link to our post-webinar survey, and instructions on how to request an attendance certificate which will be issued by request. And uh, we will also like to encourage everyone to submit their questions to our speakers through uh, the Q&A box that you see right there at the bottom of your screen. And we will basically try to accommodate as many questions as time will allow. So we would like to thank all of you uh, who are joining us today. And we would like to uh, kick off this event with a welcome address from no less than His Excellency, Ambassador Harold Fries from the Embassy of Sweden, Manila. Your Excellency. I'm sorry, Ambassador Fries, you're on mute. Could you? <laughs> Ambassador Fries. All right. I'll start again. <laughs> Thank you, Rico, for your introduction and the warm greetings to all the participants. Sustainable waste management is a major challenge all over the world. So how come the Nordic countries hardly have any new landfills or waste mountains? A big part of the answer is recycling, which is the foundation of the waste management system of the Nordic countries. For example, in Sweden, less than 1% of all household waste is deposited in landfills. In other words, more than 99% is recycled or converted to energy. This is achieved thanks to one, engaged citizens, two, government regulations and incentives, and three, extended producer responsibility, or EPR, which shifts to the waste management cost or physical collection from government responsibility to producer responsibility. The EPR framework has been adopted by all Nordic countries. To give you a more concrete idea how it, this works, Watch this short video presenting an overview of the Swedish waste disposal system.
As seen in the video, Extended Producer Responsibility, EPR, implies that producers and importers take the responsibility for collecting used goods and packaging, for sorting and treating prior to their eventual recycling. The EPR schemes implemented in the Nordic countries are in line with the polluter pays principle, which means that the party responsible for the pollution should pay for the damage done. This shift of responsibility encourages producers to improve the overall cost efficiency of collection and recycling processes, increase the recyclability of their products, diminish the amount of material used in production, and find ways to reduce waste and recover used products. Of course, we all have a responsibility to reduce waste. If producers, consumers, and government work together, a sustainable future becomes a reality. Thank you very much. Tak salamat. Over to you, Rico. Abu Heika, Your Excellency. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and for those welcome remarks. For sure, all of today's participants and attendees will learn so much from the best practices that our panelists will be presenting. And they're all representing uh, Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian companies. And before I introduce our speakers uh, for today, we have an audience poll question. We want to find out your views and sentiment, basically, um, on waste management and producer responsibility. Here is the polling question, and we will give all of you 10 seconds to answer. Here it is. Do you agree that producers have a responsibility to handle waste created by their products even after these have been sold to consumers? Let me repeat. Do you agree that producers have a responsibility to handle waste created by their, their products even after these have been sold to consumers? You can start giving your answers now. You're given three choices, agree, disagree, or undecided. You have five. Four, three, two, one. All right, we will have the results of the poll shortly. And 95% agree that the producers have a responsibility to handle waste created by their products even after these have been sold to consumers. So disagree, 1%, and undecided, 4%. Thank you very much to all our participants and attendees who participated in this poll. And that concludes our poll. Thank you very much for joining us. We now have our panel discussion segment wherein we showcase individual Nordic companies and focus on waste management and producer responsibility. So our first panelist, let me introduce uh, 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 her to you. Uh, she is uh, from Denmark. She is the Director for Sustainable Packaging at Arla Foods. Arla Foods is a Danish-Swedish multinational cooperative based in Vibi, Denmark, and the largest producer of dairy products in Scandinavia. Let us all please welcome Ms. Lise Berg Kildermark. Thank you so much for joining us. Our second panelist is from a Swedish company. She is a sustainability manager for H&M Southeast Asia. H&M is a Swedish multinational clothing retail company known for its fast fashion clothing for men, women, teenagers, and children. They operate in more than 70 countries and have over 5,000 stores under various company brands. And as all, please welcome, joining us from Singapore, Ms. Marian Dung. Our third panelist is from Norway. He is the research director of NIVA, the Norwegian Institute for Water Research. It's an environmental research organization which researches, monitors, assesses, and studies freshwater, coastal, and marine environments and environmental technology. Let us all, please welcome Ms. Dr. Thorian Larsen. Doctor, nice to have you. And our reactor uh, for today to share with us her expert comments is a senior urban development specialist in the Southeast Asia Urban Development and Water Division at the Asian Development Bank. Let us all please welcome Sui Chung Dang. Chung Dang, great to have you with us. All right, let's uh, kick off this uh, hard talk portion with uh, our first question now to uh, Ms. Dang. Uh, Ms. Dong, uh, the uh, fast fashion industry has received a lot of scrutiny for contributing to rising volumes of textile waste. What is H&M uh, doing in the region as an industry leader
to address this issue. Ms. Dang. Ms. Dang, are you there? Is Ms. Dang on mute? Hello. Yes, I, I could not unmute myself, so I had to <laughs> wait for the host. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I hope you can hear me now. Um, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Were you able to hear okay. my question? Yes. So I, if I recall, so your question was uh, how H&M is actually handling the, the waste in uh, Yeah, particularly fashion. textile waste, the rising volume of textile waste. Ms. Dan. Yeah. I think um, to keep it uh, very generic, um, the aim of H&M Group is to become fully circular and uh, climate, climate positive throughout the whole value chain. When we talk about uh, circularity and full circularity, it actually means that how can we maximize the resources and minimize waste as much as possible. So that means that we need to attack this or uh, tackle this throughout the whole value chain when we want to uh, handle management. It already actually starts at the design phase, thinking of uh, what kind of materials that we can use from recycled materials, but also designs that are durable to minimize waste as much as possible. Also up until when we are producing it, um, how can we reduce the waste there, but also actually reaching the um, garments to the customers. Uh, mm -hmm. How can we ensure are not uh, throwing away the garments or actually are um, uh, making use of the garments as long as possible to keep everything in the circle and in the loop. So when there's not like one single answer, but there's actually throughout the whole value chain that we need to tackle this issue when it comes to waste, uh, minimizing waste as much as possible. So, so Ms. Dan, uh, at this point, uh, is H&M maximizing its resources and minimizing waste? And because this is, uh, what is needed to become uh, fully circular. Yeah, so there are uh, different initiatives and different projects that we are working on. Um, several examples, number one is for instance that we are um, launching a collection which is actually created out of waste. So this is one way as an example to show how can we appreciate waste and how can we make use of waste again instead of throwing it away. So the garments that are being uh, launched in 1st of December, this uh, particular uh, collection is actually made out of uh, what is normally being thrown away. But there are other ways. So we are, for instance, having the garment collecting initiative worldwide, where we are encouraging all the customers to bring in their unwanted garments uh, for reuse and recycling instead of letting it end in landfills. Um, other initiatives, for instance, that we are testing different models um, instead of um, making uh, buying new garments, can we uh, make use of uh, the rental uh, model or uh, the clothes swapping, for instance. Um, but we are also having, for instance, the um, where we encourage customers to make use of reusables. Um, I think we come back to that maybe later, but um, mm -hmm. where we encourage customers to make use of uh, reusable shopping bags instead of single-use uh, plastic waste or single-use paper waste. So these are all so, the small initiatives. Mm -hmm. So is this initiative already, Ms. Dang, uh, uh, being uh, used to reduce waste uh, here in the Philippines, for example? Yes, um, actually good that you highlight that because we just launched it in September in the Philippines. It's called mm. Let's Reuse, where we started to charge for paper bags in our stores. Um, this is again to encourage everyone to be aware on the, um, the reduction of waste and to bring reusable bags instead. Um, I must say that uh, we did a lot in terms of trying to create this awareness, but more needs to be done for the customers mm -hmm. to really um, get into the habit of bringing reusable bags when they go for shopping, for instance. All right, uh, we'll, we'll move on now to, thank you so much uh, for uh, those, uh, uh, for those comments, uh, Ms. Dang. Uh, Ms. Uh, Kildermark, uh, let's uh, go over to you now. Uh, Arla has uh, basically invested uh, significantly in making it uh, packaging more sustainable. Um, what kind of advice can you offer to companies operating here uh, in Asia who are uh, basically considering uh, similar initiatives? Ms. Kildermark, you may be also on mute. Can you hear us? Now it works. Um, now I've, I have been unmuted. So um, okay. <laughs> uh, a very important advice from, uh, from uh, me, from Ala Foods is we are a food company. So when we are a food company, 
what comes first is we really have three non-negotiables. We must, whatever way we pack our products, ensure food safety. Um, we want to avoid food waste. Um, if we don't protect our products well enough, we end up with products uh, that will be thrown out. And that is a, a, a much worse environmental issue. Uh, and then we must make sure that our products are affordable. So balancing all these three things put a lot of uh, demand to how we then design our packaging. And, and what becomes very important here is that we, uh, for Ala, are using having a strong focus on both climate and waste. We have a strong focus on carbon um, uh, emissions. Uh, as a company, we want to become carbon net zero by, by 2050. So everything we do in designing our packaging both have to take carbon emissions into account, but of course also waste. As we heard from the ambassador, um, we don't have a lot of waste mountains in, uh, in the Northern European countries. So of course, carbon climate becomes a huge factor in the way we design our products. But mm. important here is that we are really looking into a circular solution. Uh, and for us, that right now means how can we avoid uh, using um, material that uh, has uh, um, that is derived from virgin plastic, from oil? Uh, we look very much into using fiber-based uh, solutions, which by nature um, uh, has a much lower CO2 footprint and will also disappear over time. Uh, we do depend a lot on plastic because a lot of our products are actually moist. Uh, and here we make sure we are using good quality plastic. So we are transforming a lot of our materials at the moment. We use the famous multi-laminate plastics that are very difficult to recycle. So how do we get into more mono solutions, solutions where it is easy to separate the different units of the packaging so that our consumers can dispose it in a good way so it can actually be collected and brought into a second life. So those are the things we have a lot of focus on when we are designing uh, our products, our packaging. So a lot of research and development uh, is going to uh, uh, the manufacturing of uh, your packaging, uh, Ms. Kildermark, to make it more uh, sustainable. Um, uh, but you really have uh, major ambitions because uh, uh, Arla is uh, aiming for full circularity for packaging in 2030. How do you plan to achieve this over the next decade? So it, it is quite an ambition uh, that we have set ourselves. Uh, and I would also like to say that already today, more than half of all our packaging is actually uh, coming from, uh, from uh, natural sources, from, from fiber. So we have a long journey ahead of us. But we also have to remember we are starting from a very good place. So what we have chosen to do is really to focus on the recyclability of all our materials. We have been on that journey for many years. Like many other players, the focus has been how do we design for recyclability, recognizing that the systems may not be in place in the markets where we operate. We are selling to our nutritious products to in more than 140 countries around the world. So we needed to start somewhere where we have just stepped up our ambition is to say it is not enough that it is being designed for recyclability. We really start looking at the markets where we're selling our products to ensure that our products can actually be disposed in a good way where they're being sold. Again, a main focus right now in Europe, but knowing that the solutions we develop will eventually also work very well uh, around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is very important for us. And then, as I said before, we want to phase out fossil-based uh, uh, plastic. We recognize there's a lot of plastic available in the world. How do we ensure and how do we collaborate to ensure we get the circle, the, the technical circle working so that we can start using more recycled material? Uh, we are looking at mechanical recycling, but we also recognize new technologies like what is called chem cycling where you can take more difficult plastic, uh, uh, put it through a process so we get a new high quality plastic. Our dilemma is constantly, if I'm speaking to any food manufacturers here, we are not able to put any, uh, all, uh, 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 there are strict regulations to what kind of materials we can put in contact with food in order to avoid migration. So of course we depend on high quality materials. 
And this is where we then collaborate with waste handlers, authorities, researchers, how can we speed up that process? And we know we have a tough ambition ahead of us. Tough ambition uh, indeed ahead of you. Can you cite for us briefly some examples? Are there any countries or companies here in emerging Asian economies that you are currently uh, working with and uh, transferring these best practices to? We, are, um, we follow very closely what is uh, happening in terms of uh, recycling in our uh, very big markets in, in the region. Um, not Southeast Asia, but in China, we are really happy mm. to see that they are now um, implementing recycling systems for milk cartons, so beverage cartons. We are exporting a lot of milk in cartons, fiber-based cartons. And we do believe, because CO2 footprint is so important for us, that that is a very good packaging for exporting milk around the world. We do, however, need to really see that collection systems are being set up. So we really welcome that and also hope that that will be a focus uh, in, in Philippines. We would be very uh, sad to have to convert into plastic solutions because we do believe that a product made of a lot of fiber, uh, natural material is the right way to go. We also have a lot of focus around uh, our powder sachets that we are selling in Bangladesh. I know it's slightly outside of the region, but nevertheless, how do we ensure that our sachets will not litter in the streets? So we are looking mm -hmm. into what kind of initiatives can we take with the industry and authorities to try to avoid littering. Oh yes, uh, and going now to Dr. Larson, uh, you mentioned about sachets uh, in the Philippines being one of the largest contributors to consumer plastic packaging waste, uh, Dr. Larson, and you're leading a project on plastic pollution in uh, Southeast Asia and have a case study in Cavite. Do you see any hope for improvement here in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, plastic packaging waste? Thank you, thank you, Rico. Uh, yes, of course, there is, uh, there is hope. Um, I think uh, everyone that has uh, that lives in or has been in Southeast Asia is uh, struck by the sachet culture that mm -hmm. was uh, also just mentioned. And uh, the sachet is, is a big uh, component of the plastic littering we find many places. And, uh, and um, to your uh, question regarding um, our project uh, with a pilot study in Cavite, we, we see a very nice, very impressive local initiatives to, to either move away from using the, the, the single-use uh, sachets or to, to, re, to collect and reuse the sachets into different, uh, different types of products. It is, uh, it is not a solution on the big scale, but it mobilizes a lot of activity in the villages on the ground to, to move away from, uh, from this type of product. Mm -hmm. So what best practices in Norway, Dr. Larsen, can uh, Southeast Asian economies, uh, uh, including the Philippines, learn uh, from uh, Norway in terms of tackling plastic pollution? I think, this, first of all, I used to joke that it helps a lot to be a small country. It's much easier to, to implement this in Norway than in the Philippines, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we also have to admit this has taken a long time in, in Norway. Uh, but for instance, my institute was established more than 60 years ago, and that was specifically to solve a, a, a very heavy, very terrible local pollution problem around Oslo, Norway's, Norway's capital. Now this fjord is considered as a nice and clean place, but it was not 60 years ago. So, so, so first of all, for us as a research institute, we want to, we, or we, we, we uh, contribute with the knowledge base needed to find the best solutions. So I think that is one very important point. It's not, it, it's, uh, it's not a simple solution, but we need to have the knowledge. What are the sources mm -hmm. before you can find the good solutions? Having said that, uh, I, I'm not saying that we, we have to wait by doing measures, by finding solutions. There are a lot of measures we already can do with the knowledge we have, but we also have to admit that we need to have more knowledge to, to find the best solution. That, and that is part of the uh, Norwegian or Nordic model, that there is a, there is a solid uh, say scientific base for measures being taken. Um, 
Then the extended pr producer responsibility has been mentioned several times already. And I think we have some very interesting examples there where, uh, where it is about to not only use the government to force companies to do things, but the government asked the companies, uh, uh, cooperate with the companies uh, to find the best solutions. And we have quite a few uh, very interesting examples in the Nordic mm -hmm. countries on, on how this has been working. Um, and, and the voluntary uh, mobilization of the, of the industry, I think, is a, is a very interesting model. You know, uh, Dr. Larsen, we, we talk a lot about uh, plastic waste. Uh, it, 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 uh, it gains a lot of attention. But uh, overall, it is only a small part of the total waste challenge because aquaculture, which is a big industry in Norway, uh, also here in the Philippines, uh, that sector must also have their uh, waste challenges as well. Yes, definitely. Uh, and uh, um, this is uh, discussed in, uh, I think, all countries that have extensive aquaculture, that this is an industry that is, uh, it, it also has it, its uh, waste problems, as you say. Uh, the most important, probably, for the aquaculture industry is the release of nutrients directly into the, into the ocean. So to, to, uh, to work on um, ways to reduce the environmental footprint of these industries is crucial for the development of this industry. It's a lot discussed in the, in the big Norwegian aquaculture companies, how to, how to uh, strengthen the, 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 the environmental sustainability. And I think also here there is uh, interesting links between the Norwegian and the Philippine situation. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is global, this is a global issue. It's a very important industry that have to and, and must and should grow, but it needs to grow in a sustainable way. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Larsen. I would like to go back uh, to Ms. Dang, and uh, you've been talking about the initiatives that H&M uh, has uh, basically undertaken to promote greater producer responsibility uh, within uh, your company. But uh, Ms. Dang, are you also promoting this? Are you also pushing uh, waste management and producer responsibility down to your supply chain? Yes. Um, again, very uh, important question because when we talk about mm waste management are actually becoming fully circular and climate positive, it means throughout the whole value chain. So mm. this includes actually every step in the chain um, with everyone involved in the whole uh, fashion industry. So uh, it's very important because we cannot become fully circular if we don't get everyone on board in the whole value chain and in the, in the supply chain, in fact. So um, again, it, it already starts from the design phase, but all up until uh, when we uh, use the materials, up until production, when we transport the goods, uh, when we operate our stores, and when the garments are reaching our, um, uh, our customers, and also at the end of the life cycle. And more specifically, when we talk, for instance, about um, Packaging, as well as uh, to, to tap into what has been said before, um, packaging is a very important part also in, in the uh, fashion industry. So that's why we have also made sure that um, we have a clear circular packaging strategy in our goals, um, where we want to reduce the amount of packaging, um, plastic packaging used, but also eliminate um, unnecessarily and um, problematic pl plastic, for instance. Um, but at the same time, we need to have like a circular design for packaging, making sure that by 2025, all the packaging used are either from um, actually are either compostable, reusable, or recyclable. And then by 2030, mm -hmm. all the materials used in the packaging should be then from recycled or um, other sustainably sourced materials. Um, so there's a different mm -hmm. ways that we need to tap into in order to become fully circular throughout the whole value chain. And Ms. Kilmark, would you like to add to that? Uh, it's Arla uh, promoting greater producer responsibility uh, all the way down uh, through its value chain. Uh, absolutely, we uh, we take responsibility through the value chain, and also we we started our own sites, our own production sites. Uh, how do we uh, manage uh, packaging waste already there? And as I said, how do we design so that uh, the products can be handled in the best way by um, by recycling uh, uh, facilities. So what we what we um, really encourage is that we are being rewarded for actually designing uh, our material in a way so it can be uh, handled very uh, easily by waste handlers, and also that we are being rewarded for using sustainable materials. So any uh, producer responsibility uh, fee 
should it sh it should really uh, differ depending on the sustainability of the materials being used and that is also what we see in a, in a lot of our markets that that is the case because that is an incentive for us to really use the most uh, sustainable uh, materials as well and uh, during uh, the speech of uh, the ambassador he uh, spoke about uh, EPR or extended uh, producer responsibility a scheme for uh, packaging waste. Uh, uh, Ms. Kildermark, uh, what concrete uh, recommendations could your company give uh, Southeast Asian governments or the Philippine government for implementing uh, an EPR? I would actually say that Sweden is a very good example with EPR because they have different price levels or tax levels depending on the complexity of the material. So they are really uh, recognizing when you are using a pure, simple material. So I would certainly say that is a, a very good uh, a model to, to look into. So, so really uh, differentiate uh, the, the, the cost depending on the, the, um, the, the friendliness or the sustainability of the materials. And uh, Dr. Larsen, would you like to add to this uh, in terms of uh, implementing uh, the extended producer responsibility? Yeah, I think what I would very much like to highlight, uh, and that's also uh, from the Nordic experience, um, mm -hmm. it's great to have recyclable products, but then uh, in, in order for that to be uh, successful, you need to have the infrastructure to, mm -hmm. to handle the waste, to, to collect the waste, to handle the waste and to recycle. So to the whole complexity of the problem, on the one hand, you need to have infrastructure in place. That is a government job. It can be financed or funded in different ways, but the expensive, boring infrastructure is, is one key element to, to be successful here um, as well. Then in the complete other end of the scale is about the, every single person's uh, willingness and attitude towards um, using products, uh, recycling, um, and... and um, well, having having a relation to what they do with the packaging, the products they buy. So, so it's a very wide range of measures that need to be taken, everything mm -hmm. from right. a single individual's motivation to the big, boring, expensive infrastructure uh, in investments. So I'm and sorry, the bottom line is, uh, Dr. Larson, uh, it will also have to be cost effective for many, uh, for company, for many companies, and uh, they'll have to really find out if uh, it is a if it is profitable for them, uh, if they can gain from it in the medium to long term. Yeah, and this is one thing I think is extremely interesting in the in the global picture today, but in particular in Southeast Asia, is, mm. is how and to what extent now having a more sustainable product, a more sustainable packaging than your competitors give you a competitive edge or not. I think we are probably seeing it in, in some places, maybe some of the, around the richer big cities. Uh, we see a tendency to that actually working, but how that will work on the, on the big scale in the big countries. Um, I'm very curious about how that will, would uh, develop. And it would be interesting to, to hear from my two panelists from the industry, how they, how they see that if there is a competitive edge in Southeast Asia on having sustainable, for instance, packaging. So, uh, Ms. Dan, uh, from the question of Dr. Larson, uh, does it give you a competitive edge? Is uh, the circular economy approach uh, ultimately good for business? Uh, what's the question for, for, for me? Uh, you heard uh, Dr. Larson about the, having the competitive edge uh, in terms mm. of waste management and producer responsibility um, for H&M. Uh, is a circular economy yeah. uh, approach uh, ultimately good for business? Of course, yes. So actually, that is the only way to move forward. So we need to be more sustainable. We need to work towards a circular model um, because that is the only thing that works long term, right? So in terms of... Um, profit or a competitive edge, definitely, because it's about meaningful growth. So again, how can we grow at the same time, but also using less resources, but also minimizing waste? That is actually the ideal situation, that we move from a linear approach towards a whole circular approach, whereby we keep everything in the system and in the loop. And in the end, this will actually remain, um, make fashion relevant in the long term and keep the business 
uh, profitable, but also growing in the long term. So becoming circular and uh, sustainable fashion, that is actually the only way to move forward. So is it really the way to move forward, uh, Ms. Kildermark, uh, shifting, uh, moving from a linear uh, economic model to a circular economy? Um, overall, is it good for business? Yes, I can only agree with uh, what also uh, Mrs. Dang was saying, because uh, this is an expectation nowadays from our consumers, so the people who buy our foods, but also from our customers, our retailers, the supermarkets. Uh, there are quite strict demands now from our customers to what extent we need to um, make our products recyclable, reduce plastics, et cetera, et cetera. So it is just a, a, a condition now for being uh, in the business. Uh, what I would like to say, uh, which is also very closely related to EPR, we have to remember that a lot of the new solutions that are coming up, the new materials, uh, they're still scarce. There's a lot of demand. It can add cost uh, to the product. So it is really, really important also to ensure that our products still become, uh, continue to be reachable, affordable, uh, that we balance that cost. So having, in, in, as we do, investing in more expensive materials, if also we would start seeing a, a, a high tax coming on top, uh, then it starts becoming difficult to manage the uh, 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 good prices for you know, daily consumer goods as what dairy products are in our business. So very important for authorities to, to recognize uh, that the price needs to, to be balanced. And also as uh, Dr. Larson said, how do we then ensure that we have fully optimal, well-functioning systems uh, and that uh, industry has a say in how does it best work in the different markets. Indeed, uh, I, uh, what, yes, would you like to add? Ms. Yeah, Jones? I want to add something because um, I completely agree that this is something now that customers also demand and uh, request from companies, right? To be like uh, socially responsible, environmentally responsible and so on. Mm -hmm. But actually we need to take a step further so that we need to lead, we need to be ahead of actually what the customers demand, especially in this region. Uh, so for example, with the Philippines, H&M um, is then one of the first retailers to charge for their uh, paper bags, which was completely new. So we needed to really spend time in explaining to the customers why we are doing this and uh, what is the uh, positive effect of this. So instead of um, doing what is demanded from the customers, I think we as uh, a large organizations have the influence to drive and to lead the change towards a, a more sustainable and circular uh, economy. I think that's very important to, to highlight. For sure, uh, many Philippine companies and uh, emerging Southeast Asian economy, economies would like to adopt the uh, best practices that you have just uh, all mentioned, uh, particularly for waste management and producer responsibility, but I'm sure there are still a lot of the limitations. So Dr. Larson, briefly, maybe you can tell us what can governments here and development partners such as the Asian Development Bank do to encourage improved waste management and greater producer responsibility? Mm, that's a big question. Um, but uh, as we have discussed, uh, as I mentioned already, the, the need for infrastructure is obvious. Mm. Uh, and that is as I said, it is expensive. It needs to be funded. So to find good ways to fund that, that would both work and in, to some extent mobilize the population. For, for instance, right. again, in the Nordic countries, we have a very high acceptance for paying a tax that make the waste collection and, and right. uh, waste handling possible. Um, there has to be incentives. Uh, yes, yes, there has to be exactly. incentives. So, and, and also the political it, will, I think, Dr. Larson, is also very important. The political will, and uh, I think that also the 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 issue of explaining to people, uh, mm. and you need to show it by by doing that. Yes, you have to pay a fee for your waste being collected, but if mm -hmm. you see that it actually works, then we have a tolerance to to pay that tax. Of course, if it doesn't work, if you pay a tax and you don't see that it, that it uh, that you're paying for something you don't get, then it doesn't work. So I think a very important issue would be to find good models to, to finance the necessary infrastructure. We would like to thank uh, Dr. Larson, Ms. Dang, and Ms. Kildermark for their, uh, for their uh, um, answers, uh, for their statements uh, regarding uh, waste management and producer responsibility. We'll be moving on now to the question and answer portion. But before that, we would like uh, to get uh, the views of uh, 
uh, Chang Dang from the Asian Development Bank on how relevant or applicable are these systems discussed by our panelists from H&M, Arla, and NIVA for Southeast Asian countries. Uh, Chang Dang. Thank you very much, Rico, and uh, thank you very much all the speakers for your insights into this issue of uh, solid waste management. Um, so uh, if I can just make a very quick comment, uh, I really like what you were talking about, especially uh, from Ala Foods and from H&M. Uh, I, I would like to make a distinction here between uh, corporate social responsibilities, CSR as we know it, and the issue of uh, risk management. So what we have heard from Ms. Dang and from Ms. Kudermark is that now being uh, managing waste, being in the circular economy is not a nice thing to do, which is AS, uh, CSR, but it's the essential thing to do. If we don't work on it, we cannot grow sustainably. So I think there's a very uh, strong distinction between these two. And we see more and more of that coming from the private sector, especially from these leading uh, companies that we see with Ala Foods and H&M. But what I would like to see more is those um, you know, uh, SMEs, you know, SSMEs, uh, micro, uh, medium and small sized uh, companies, especially mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia, more of those economies, uh, economies taking uh, responsible uh, responsibility in, in such a way. Mm -hmm. um, if I can just take another minute, uh, Rico, uh, Christian, yes. would you mind um, showing a, a slide? I just want I have one slide that I would like to share with you here. Um, so in one of the studies that we looked at in uh, our uh, in ADB in Southeast Asia, we know that uh, by 2040, about 140 million tons of municipal waste will be generated into the environment. Um, and the total economic losses of the plastic component of this waste will be between 68 and uh, 340 billion dollars per year. So um, we, we talked about the cost of managing waste, but also there is a very high cost of not managing it. This is the cost of not doing anything. Um, and at the same time, the scale of the problem of the problem teaches us or shows us that there will be no one solution to this. There will have to be a suite of solutions and solutions coming from the private sector as we heard uh, today will be very, very important. So all I can say is what I, uh, I would like to see more of these initiatives coming and taking the lead in the, in the industry. Uh, as the Asian Development Bank, uh, we want to uh, place this kind of approach in the context of the countries where we work um, so that we look at it not only from the infrastructure uh, side of things as uh, Dr. Lassen has uh, emphasized the importance of, but also place that in the environment, the regulatory, the policy framework, um, as well as the capacity of the institutions and the private sector in order to embrace this uh, new approach assess the issue. Um, so I, I think my time is up. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment on this. Thanks, Rico. Thank you so much uh, for uh, your reaction uh, to the uh, insights of our uh, speakers today, uh, representing Swedish, Norwegian, and Danish companies. And now uh, we would like to move on to the question and answer portion. From what I see right now, we have uh, a lot of questions from our attendees, uh, close to 210 currently with us uh, right now. And uh, we would like to ask the first question, uh, most probably to uh, uh, Ms. Dang. And uh, the question is, uh, for consumer goods, producers, distributors, and retailers, what financial benefits would justify paying for ERP apart from mitigation of customers' boycott? Ms. Dang? Um, interesting question. Actually, I don't fully understand what is uh, being asked. For consumer goods producers, distributors, and retailers, what financial benefits would justify paying for the ERP? Or would we, uh, would uh, Ms. Gildermark, would you like to answer uh, that question instead about the ERP? So what would justify the, the ERP? Yes, uh, for consumers, goods producers, distributors and retailers, what financial benefits would justify paying the ERP? I think the financial benefits would be 
I, I think we all have a responsibility to manage the waste we have uh, on our planet. So it probably doesn't come without a cost and we need to find out how we share that in the best way. And as I said before, it is important that companies don't actually try to do uh, 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 take initiatives to come out with the easiest handle, handleable uh, material is also being uh, incentivized and recognized for it. So it is important that uh, uh, EPR systems are, are taking care of, of that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Lise. Uh, let's uh, ask this question now to uh, Ms. Dang. How does your uh, company, H&M, instill the circular economy to your employees? What organizational values, culture, have been introduced as you started embracing this new business model of the circular economy? Hmm. So again, um, when we talk about circular model, it means the whole value chain, also including our uh, colleagues, what we do in our operations and so on and so on. So we are continuously also updating our internal staff um, and our colleagues on what we do when it comes to um, circularity and sustainable fashion. Um, maybe one good thing to highlight what we started in the Philippines as well when it comes to waste management, we started a pilot where we are um, uh, introducing the recycling routines in our stores, where we encourage all our staff to actually recy recycle the waste. So instead of throwing everything in a general waste bin, uh, put it in the um, plastics bin or the paper bin or uh, the electronics to, to recycle. Um, this is then coming back also to uh, the, the challenge that uh, Dr. Larson is saying, that in order to make this very effective, we need to make sure that there's an infrastructure to do so. Because what happens with the waste after it leaves the store, that is then still a big question mark. But this is an example of how we are integrating sustainability and circularity throughout the whole practices, whether it comes to the packaging or the garments that we use on the production, but also in our own operations. So it's a, a very important part uh, and part of the company values. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Dan. Uh, this question goes to everyone, uh, maybe H&M uh, and maybe even uh, Dr. Larson. Uh, with the popularity right now, of online shopping uh, because of uh, the uh, pandemic, uh, um, basically, and the packaging that comes with it. Uh, what do you think should the likes of Amazon or online uh, shopping platforms do to encourage reuse, reduce, and recycle? Dr. Larson. Um. I think, again, in, in this field, there is, uh, we see an increasing uh, consumer or customer demand on uh, that is pushing the the big online shopping companies to to change their their packaging. Uh, I think we see it uh, here in in Europe. Uh, we see that things are now much more typically just packed in uh, in in paper or carton, not much plastic anymore. Uh, and uh, I also know a little bit about this from from China, where we see that there is a big push because of, of, uh, of uh, request from consumers that the, that the amount of packaging used is reduced. For instance, we, we uh, used to see that a, uh, a product was packed in the, in the normal box and then the, when shipping it, they put another box around it. We see much less of that. Uh, so there is a tendency, I think, again, pushed by the consumer demand to use less packaging and more sustainable packaging. Uh, here's a follow-up question, uh, Dr. Larson. With fears of uh, secondary transmission, um, I'm sure they're talking about here the, uh, the COVID-19, if reusable materials are used, would the reimposition of a plastic ban be feasible during this pandemic? What would be a balanced approach in land-based economic activity that has little impact on oceans look like? Um, that was for me a, a couple of questions. Uh, I think one was related to that we that we do see a, a big change in uh, plastic use and single use products during the pandemic. Um, um, but there there are it's, it's uh, for some 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 areas the the single use plastic uh, use increased during the pandemic, but we also see that in other sectors is actually decreasing. So it's a big, it's a big shift in the, in the say the waste uh, footprint because, because mm -hmm. of this. And I think the other part of the question was related to, and if, if that was the question, I like it very much because the question, 
it's about how all activities on land is what uh, contributing the most to the pollution yes. we see in the ocean, and mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and and again here I think it has been a very positive shift the last few years, um, when uh, or as new knowledge have emerged on this on the topic of marine litter and, and plastic pollution, uh, so we see now much less focus on say uh, trying to clean up the ocean, but we see a much much more focus on trying to stop the problem at the source, uh, meaning again uh, having a, a, a much better um, grip and handling on activities on land in the cities that ultimately will be transported by the rivers to the coast. So it's uh, if, if you look at how, what the situation just five years ago and now, it's actually something positive has happened, uh, although it, it, it may not look like in the first sight. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Larson, for that uh, interesting response. Uh, let's move on now to Ms. Kildermark and uh, Ms. Zhang. Uh, this question is for you. As uh, large multinational companies, how have H&M and are the foods been able to integrate circular systems in their operations and value chains in an efficient and effective way? For example, how do they get buy-in? Do they have to calculate financial returns? Let's start off with you, uh, Ms. Kildermark. Thanks. Um, what I would like to say here, it's also about a cultural change that if, if you want uh, sustainability, it needs to uh, start at the top of the organization. And I must say in ALA, uh, uh, it, it really starts at uh, our top management. And we have set up a fantastic system, I think a bit like uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Stang was talking about, how do we really break up the company into different pillars uh, so that we are tackling all parts of our value chain uh, with a very uh, focused uh, approach. And uh, we are a farmer owned company. We have more than 11,000 owners. And if our farmers are not buying into wanting to be more sustainable, then it does become very uh, difficult. But I must say we have the full endorsement from the farmers. And of course, everything you do comes with a cost. And it's a matter of making that visible, transparent. So we are actually doing lots of calculations to convert our different, in, in, different initiatives into what is actually the price for the farmer per liter of milk. But on the other hand, we are also being rewarded for doing a, a lot of sustainability initiatives. It is driving our, our brand and our products, being the largest organic milk producer in the world. It goes really hand in hand with sustainable packaging, a sustainable approach. Our milk, just to say, is actually having the lowest, more than half of the CO2, food, the CO2 footprint of milk, the average liter of milk in the world. And that is what our consumers are really recognizing. And then of course, they're also ready to pay uh, an additional um, a price for the products if, if that would be the case. So it, it, it is very important to have that full uh, balance between uh, cost and benefit and uh, the top man is buying. Ms. Dan, would you like to add to that? How has H&M uh, been able to integrate circular systems and their operations and value chain in an efficient and effective way? Yeah, so actually uh, also to add on uh, what Ms. Gildermart has said. So number one is raising yeah. awareness, uh, being transparent mm -hmm. to throughout the whole supply chain, explaining why we are doing certain things, what is the benefit and um, what, what is it actually, uh, how does it impact everyone in, in the business? Um, so most of the part is really about raising awareness and educating everyone. But then number two about the cost. In the long term, so this is the only way to move uh, forward in the long term, right? So in the end, the cost that we will make now, uh, we will be able to still grow in a meaningful way. Um, so that is the thing about the cost that we make now. In the end, it will still uh, return or actually return on investment. But uh, other than that, it's also very important to mention that uh, in order to reduce the cost, we need to may be able to scale the innovations and scale the technologies that we use. So for instance, when we talk about sustainable materials, how can we scale it to bring down the cost, for instance. So that is another part. Um, so yes, it comes also with the cost, but if we collaborate, if we continue and innovate, we can bring down the cost because of the scalability. That's an uh, important part as well to become fully circular. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Dang. Uh, a question here for uh, Dr. Larson, having uh, uh, been here to the country and uh, uh, working on a project in Cavite, what do you think uh, is the best approach for the Philippines to get better at waste management. Uh, carrot, 
stick or is it a mix of both carrot and stick? And why? And where can the impact, uh, where, what impact can be expected to be highest? Consumers, sellers, government, or producers? I think, uh, again, a very big question, a very important question. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, it's impossible to answer. Uh, it's a mix of, of everything uh, mentioned. Um, again, I, I think I want to highlight the, 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 the wide range of different measures that need to be taken. Um, so uh, to find good, uh, good, uh, good uh, say, uh, solutions, a combination of carrot and stick, so definitely a mix, that will work in the Philippines. I'm, I'm sure you cannot in the Philippines just copy the, the Nordic model for sure. So it needs mm -hmm. to be... You need to be found what works uh, locally. Um, and again, if it's consumers, sellers, government or producers, again, I think all of them. And again, we need to find, uh, or you need to find a good balance uh, that will fit the, the situation in the Philippines. So I definitely don't want to say that I have the solution on how to do this and I'm coming and telling you how to do it. Uh, but it is complex. You need to uh, know it is complex. And uh, uh, it needs to take time and, uh, and it can be solved. I think that's also an important uh, part of, of the answer. And, and briefly, uh, here's a follow-up question to that. Um, the Philippines is known for its, what you call a convenience store, Sari Sari store, uh, selling plastic wrap goods and small sachets for one-time use. How do you change the mindset to reduce this huge waste coming from this mindset? Uh, again, a very good question. Uh, I and uh, I'm asking the question myself. Uh, again, I I will not answer how this this can be done, but I'm sure it can be done. Um, again, using the um, say the Nordic experience on on changing people's mindset uh, on on uh, on how you deal with waste. Uh, it has been done in a Nordic country. It takes a long mm -hmm. time. Uh, because also in, in Norway, when I was a child, we, people threw waste uh, everywhere. Uh, so it is a it is a long process um, that that, uh, that will take time, but can be handled. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Larson, Ms. Bang, and uh, Ms. Kildermark uh, uh, for uh, your uh, your responses, for your insights to uh, waste management and. Uh, producer responsibility. And, um, you know, there's still many challenges uh, uh, in implementing it. Uh, still a lot to be desired, but uh, moving, hopefully, in, in the right direction. And we would like to thank all our uh, uh, participants uh, for who have asked our panelists uh, these very important uh, questions today. And uh, for the closing remarks on this uh, final of the two-day webinar on waste management and the uh, circular uh, economy, let us all please welcome the director for the Southeast Asia Urban Development and Water Division at the Asian Development Bank. Let us all please welcome Vijay Padmanabhan. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, hello to all those who are probably waking up early morning to watch this session. Uh, I would first like to really thank uh, all the uh, embassies, the three embassies and the Excellencies Ambassadors who provided us time to open uh, these sessions and to the panelists for a wonderful and healthy uh, discussion on the subject matter. Uh, Enrico, a special thanks to you for conducting this two-day session, uh, getting us through and having a pretty uh, deep and detailed uh, discussion on the circular economy. Uh, just in terms of the Asian Development Bank and the amount of work that we're doing with cities, uh, it's quite extensive. We're working across Asia Pacific in over 150 odd cities where uh, the solid waste management is one of the most uh, critical subject matters that we work on. Uh, and of course, given the rapid urbanization that we uh, are seeing in this part of the world uh, and with almost 75% uh, of the urban population of the world going to be in Asia Pacific, uh, it's pretty clear that the amount of waste being generated, whether it's solid or liquid waste, is going to be pretty extensive and uh, we really need to find solutions. 
Uh, and there's no better way than to actually have a collaborative effort between uh, multilaterals, foundations, the private sector, and the governments to ensure that we are actually able to provide uh, pretty, uh, you know, state-of-the-art solutions or uh, solutions that are actually more creative and coming bottom-up from all of you as uh, producers of uh, these products and also ensuring that citizens are well-educated on how they use products and how uh, products are being recycled for further uh, use downstream. Uh, from the Asian Elephant Bank, uh, we do work on policy and regulatory matters. Uh, we support city governments and utilities on infrastructure, governance, finance, subject matters. We look at creditworthiness. Uh, but obviously, uh, institutions have uh, a varying level of efficiencies uh, and varying level of creditworthiness. Clearly, when consumers are well-educated on uh, resource consumption and they're able to practice uh, better waste management and recycling, or what we also seen recently is upcycling of waste, uh, there would be a better environment and a better uh, nature to conserve and to enjoy. Uh, we are actually in a situation, whether it's oceans health or whether it's biodiversity, uh, natural capital cities, we really need to look at uh, conservation efforts. So any efforts being made by us as a community, by uh, producers, the private sector or uh, multilateral banks like the Asian Elephant Bank who can actually educate consumers and citizens on uh, better resource consumption will go a long way in conserving nature and preserving the biodiversity. So I clearly see that uh, as a bank, we would be able to uh, take things forward in terms of uh, supporting uh, these initiatives. Uh, and we look, really look forward uh, to kind of uh, taking these ideas forward and working uh, more closely with uh, the private sector uh, to take forward our uh, agenda. Uh, in conclusion, I just would like to mention what Alison, my colleague, had mentioned yesterday on ADB Strategy 2030 and our agenda on our operational priorities. Two priorities that we really focus a lot in cities. One is on tackling climate change, disaster resilience, and also environmental sustainability, which clearly is uh, very closely related to the subject. Uh, and the second is to make cities livable. Uh, so by combining these two priorities and uh, taking forward the lessons that we learned from these two day webinars, uh, I think we have a lot to work on and a lot of food for thought. So once again, from uh, ADB, uh, all of us here, uh, a sincere thanks to all of you for participating in these two day webinar. Uh, and we hope to uh, have more such sessions where we could learn from each other and uh, actually apply some of these good practices. So thank you once again. Uh, Rico, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vijay, for those thoughtful and insightful remarks. And uh, before we wrap up, we would like to remind all the participants who have joined us today that uh, you can basically, uh, that you will receive an email before the end of the week where we will include, number one, the link to this webinar recording, two, the link to our post-webinar survey, and thirdly, instructions on how to request an attendance certificate which will be issued by request. So we would like to thank all of you for joining us today and for this two-day webinar as we tackle the circular economy, waste management, and producer responsibility uh, brought to you um, by the Asian Development Bank, the Embassy of Sweden in Manila, the Norwegian Embassy Manila, the Royal Danish Embassy Manila, and uh, Business Sweden and the Council of ministers. Thank you so much for investing your time with us. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a wonderful rest of your day. I'm Rico Hizon. Bye for now.